Uh, and one of them is, uh, is John Burroughs, who I've been privileged to work with now for, for a number of years. John is the Executive Director of the Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy, uh, based here in New York. Uh, he represents the Lawyers Committee uh, in uh, nuclear non-proliferation treaty review proceedings uh, in the UN otherwise, uh, and other international forums. He was a member of the Marshall Islands International Legal Team, talk about internationalism, uh, in its nuclear disarmament cases before the International Court of Justice. His publications in which he's been a contributor uh, include Unspeakable Suffering, The Humanitarian Impacts of Nuclear Weapons, uh, Assuring Destruction Forever, Nuclear Weapon Modernization Around the World. Uh, he's the author of The Legality of Threat or Use of Nuclear Weapons, A Guide to the Historic Opinion of the International uh, Criminal Court of, uh, Court of Justice. Uh, and he also has published articles and op-eds in journals and newspapers, including the Fordham uh, International Law Journal, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, uh, Arms Control Today, the World Policy Journal, uh, and Newsday. He has taught international law as an adjunct professor at the Rutgers School of Law in Newark. Uh, not a bad resume. Well, one of the presentations I was really struck by was the one by Tina Stegner, uh, talking about the Marshall Islands. Uh, the Marshall Islands brought nuclear disarmament cases in the International Court of Justice against all nine nuclear powers. And then, just because of the way jurisdiction works, actually litigated those against three of the nuclear powers, uh, the United Kingdom, Indian, Pakistan. Uh, it was just a marvelous effort uh, by, by the Marshall Islands and by their incredible then Foreign Minister, Tony De Bruyne. Uh, much to our dis disappointment, uh, the International Court of Justice, by very, very narrow margins, as narrow as they could be, uh, ruled that they did not have jurisdiction to go forward to the merits uh, last uh, October. But for those of you who like to dig into things, I encourage you to look at the pleadings that are on the International Court of Justice website for those, those cases. Uh, and so the question was asked of Tina, is there a good pivot in effect for the Marshall Islands from the ICJ cases to the nuclear ban treaty? Well, a very good question. The ICJ cases were about directly challenging the countries that have uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, the nuclear ban treaty uh, I'm going to talk about it, but it's partly just aiming to reaffirm and advance kind of ideals, moral and legal uh, standards, but it does not in and of itself directly challenge uh, the nuclear armed states. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the Marshall Islands is participating fully in the negotiations at, uh, at the United Nations. Uh, and. But, you know, they do it with some sense of reality because nuclear weapons are real to the Marshallese. <laughs> and uh, the uh, nuclear ban treaty is, in part, as I just said, it's, it's partly like a, a moral and educational effort. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk about that a little more. So uh, the first UN General Assembly Resolution 1946 sought to set in motion a process to eliminate nuclear weapons and other WMD. The 1950s and 1960s, and it really, it was, it was a time of ferment on all sorts of levels. Well, one level was in the international system, there was really rather full discussion of general and complete disarmament, including nuclear disarmament. Uh, then it sort of uh, dialed back, we got the non-proliferation treaty, which was aiming to spread the, uh, prevent the spread of nuclear weapons and also committed in vague terms the nuclear powers to negotiate nuclear disarmament. The 1990s, after the Soviet Union disintegrated, we saw a real burst of multilateral disarmament. Uh, chemical Weapons Convention, very elaborate treaty for the elimination of chemical weapons. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, the extension of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. During that time, and Alan Ware sitting right here was heavily involved with this, 
Uh, people, uh, including a lot of experts uh, who had deep experience with the UN, uh, elaborated a model of the Nuclear Weapons Convention, which, like the chemical weapons, was a comprehensive scheme for the prohibition and elimination of nuclear weapons. Well, even those of you who are younger know that uh, things kind of started to slide backwards after the 1990s in terms of disarmament and other things. Uh, and so the model, the idea of a nuclear weapons convention, even though it had support from the same large number of countries that are now pushing forward the nuclear ban treaty, it, it wasn't getting much traction uh, beyond that. Uh, so in the meantime, the nuclear armed states, the United States had been putting forward the idea that they were pursuing a step-by-step -step approach to nuclear disarmament. Well, to some of us, at least, that sounds pretty good. It's like, it's a very serious subject matter. You should have a pragmatic, sober approach to it. But it's not working. And you can also uh, ask yourself the following question. If, if you're hiking in the mountains and you have to cross a chasm to get to the other side. Do you want to take a step-by-step -step approach to that? <laughs> uh, so that was a question I it would believe, well, I'll figure out who said that at some point. So uh, the Obama administration came up with some fairly modest steps for nuclear arms control, but they ran into a whole lot of resistance, which they didn't seem to want to invest the political capital, capital in to overcome. So now here we are. The non-nuclear uh, weapon states, with a big, big assist from civil society, said, OK, we're going to take agency. It's our world, too. And nuclear explosions affect us, too. Uh, so th they came forward with the idea of a nuclear weapons prohibition treaty, a ban treaty. There's a direct link from the idea of, of the model nuclear weapons convention to the nuclear ban treaty. The nuclear ban treaty, in effect, is slimming down the model nuclear weapons convention so it includes the prohibitions. Don't have them, don't use them, but it doesn't include, essentially, the provisions about uh, disarmament, verify disarmament. And so the non-nuclear weapon states said, we're going to go ahead with this process with or without the nuclear weapon states. And interestingly, no, I think the world is shifting in more ways than, than uh, uh, not, not only the rise of authoritarianism, but you know, China's playing an interesting role. Uh, China showed some interest in participating in these negotiations, uh, eventually decided not to. So now it is, uh, it's basically an initiative of the Global South countries, but also including uh, uh, Austria, uh, Ireland, so the negotiations are taking place now. They'll conclude uh, July 7th. You can follow them on reachingcriticalwill.org. There's also a UN website which you can find under the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs. Uh, the treaty itself has general obligations. So each state party, the draft treaty, I should say, it's now being discussed. Each state party undertakes never under any circumstances to develop, produce, manufacture, acquire, possess, or stockpile nuclear weapons. Uh, it uh, has provisions about victim assistance and environmental remediation. Now, a question was asked about these obligations uh, earlier today. I don't know if they're going to survive into you know, the final version of the treaty. But if they do, I think they'll probably cover both past and, and hopefully events in the future which don't happen. Uh, the uh, ban treaty draft also wants to signal to nuclear armed states and also to allies of nuclear armed states that they are welcome to join the treaty. Well, this is complicated, of course. Actually, I should say extremely complicated in the case of countries that have nuclear weapons. How would you set it up so they could join this treaty, even though they are refusing to 
participate in its negotiation. But nonetheless, uh, part of this is, uh, it's like an exercise in good faith. This is the kind of world we want to live in, and we're inviting you to join us. Uh, and there are a, a, a couple of basic paths. One is uh, sort of taken from the model of South Africa, which had a small nuclear arsenal, gave it up, joined the NPT. Uh, one path is that a country would eliminate its nucle nuclear arsenal, join the nuclear ban treaty, and then sort of demonstrate to the International Atomic Energy Agency that it had, in fact, eliminated its nuclear arsenal. The other path, and this is where it gets kind of complicated, would be to try to structure the treaty so it could be the nuclear ban treaty, so it could be the basis for a supplementary agreement that would uh, involve the verified irreversible elimination of nuclear armed states' arsenals, and then they could join the treaty, or possibly they would join the treaty and then subject to monitoring, uh, eliminate their arsenal. <clears throat> so what is the significance of this effort? It is too early to know. First of all, we have to see if a completed treaty comes out of this process. If I'm asked to guess or predict, I would say yes, but we'll see. Uh, but uh, secondly is how much is it going to require the member states to do? Let me criticize a little bit the states that have been pushing this treaty. They should be ready to take on really affirmative obligations that require them to do things they're not already doing or refraining from doing. I'm talking about prohibitions on transit of materials and equipment and components uh, across their territory. I'm talking about prohibitions on financing of nuclear weapons uh, manufacture disarmament education. So will this treaty, assuming it comes into existence, will it be a statement of moral and legal standards? Uh, will it allow the non-nuclear weapon states to join together as a potent collective actor? Will it be, as many hope and believe, truly a transformational paradigm? Well, the, the proof will be in its uh, evolution. But I think for uh, new generations, uh, for publics and advocates in nuclear armed states, it will, at a minimum, it will be a powerful statement of expectations and we should make use of it. <clears throat>